Good morning, family, and welcome to our Palm Sunday sermon. Can you believe it? It's Palm Sunday already, but let's open up with a word of prayer. Precious Father, thank you for this day that you've blessed us with, but Father, thank you that we can remember as you entered Jerusalem, Lord Jesus, to accomplish what we couldn't do for ourselves. And Holy Spirit, I pray now that you may hide me behind the cross so that your beloved people will not see or hear me, but hear and see you, Holy Spirit, speak through me into their very lives. So Holy Spirit, please, I pray for soft soil in our hearts, and may the seed of your word fall on soft soil in each of our hearts and grow in accordance with your perfect timing. In Jesus' name, amen. So the theme that I believe the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart for us to explore this morning is a path to peace through the King of Kings. A path to peace through the King of Kings, okay? And it follows our gospel reading for this morning. Now, I think it goes without saying that wanting to feel whole and complete as an individual is something that all of us desire. You know, I think all of us want to feel whole and complete within ourselves in life. And I think it's a fair assumption to make Now, the biblical concept of peace, which I have often used in sermons before, is not merely an absence of conflict, but a state of completion or wholeness. For example, the wall that's standing behind me, there's no gaps in it, there's nothing that's breaking it apart. So you would say, in biblical terms, that the wall is shalom, it's whole, it's complete. So therefore, in the biblical understanding to be at peace would be to be shalom, to be made whole, to be complete. Now this of course leads to the obvious conclusion that in each of us there is something that we feel is lacking in our lives that makes us feel incomplete, that makes us feel not shalom. Now this was really driven home to me this past week as I watched a documentary on one of my all-time favorite childhood heroes. Now if you grew up in the Uh, sort of the mid-90s to the early 2000s like I did, chances are you stumbled across WWE, which, um, which is World Wrestling Entertainment, which I mean for me, only in the last 15 years really did I uncover that it's not real, it's all scripted. But with that, I had one of my favorite wrestlers who was known as Shawn Michaels, and I think he's a trainer now, a wrestling trainer. And he shares in this documentary about his life that when he won his first WWE World Heavyweight Championship reign, which again, it's all scripted, uh, not scripted, it's all scripted, rather, not scripture, scripted, it's all scripted. He said when he won that title, he became belligerent with a colleague of his who had been a longtime friend. He was like, get out of the ring, I don't want you here, this is my moment. And he said as he put the heavyweight championship belt around his waist. He thought this childhood dream is leaving me feeling empty. Because even as he put the title around his waist, which I'm sure was something he fantasized about from when he was a child, it just he said actually in the documentary, this is not how it should feel. And when he got that title, it made him belligerent towards those around him. In a way, years later, he says he can't still understand But beloved, isn't that what we do? When we pursue the thing we think we need to have peace, to have our wholeness, we pursue it at all costs, no matter how it hurts us, all those around us, and many times when we ascertain it, when we get it, or when we arrive at that place that we think will bring us peace, it never lasts. And there's this profound quote by St. Augustine of Hippo, who's an early church father, and he says in his writings, Peace is not sought in order to provoke war, but war is waged in order to attain peace. I want to repeat that again. Peace is not sought in order to provoke war, but war is waged in order to attain peace. So we could say that we wage war to try and attain our peace, our wholeness for ourselves. Now, family, I want you to hold on to what the biblical concept of peace means and what we try and do to ascertain it in our lives as we explore today's gospel reading, which leads me to my first point, the King of Kings has come. So at this point, as as recorded in Luke's gospel, Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem to celebrate his last Passover. Now, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem is steeped in such rich Old Testament symbolism 
of the Messiah King coming into Jerusalem. In verse 35 of Luke's gospel, of our gospel reading, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a colt, on a young donkey, which is fulfilling the messianic prophecy of Zechariah 9 verse 9, which is a prophecy about the Messiah, which says, and I paraphrase, look Jerusalem, your king comes to you lowly and riding on a donkey. He's fulfilling that messianic prophecy. So Jesus is identifying himself to his first century Jewish audience that he is the long-awaited Messiah. He's the king of Zion. Now, this is not some later misinterpretation by biblical scholars, but Jesus himself in verses 39 to 40 states that if the disciples, and we know by extensions the crowds around him as told through the other gospels, if they stop praising him, that the stones themselves would cry out and start to praise him. Now, Jesus, by responding to the Pharisees with a statement, the commentaries that I read in preparation tells us that Jesus is identifying himself to the Pharisees and to all the people around him as the Lord over all. As through the Old Testament, we find that all creation should praise the Lord of all. Creation being the stones and all people, everyone should praise the Lord of all. So Jesus is A, identifying himself as God and Messiah, and B, he is endorsing the praises of his disciples and by extension the crowd to be good and proper, to be the right thing to do. Yet despite their praise of him being fitting and proper, Luke in his gospel, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, records something at Jesus' triumphal entry that none of the other Gospels record. In verses 41 to 44, we find Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. Now, beloved, this has incredible implications for us today, which takes me to my second point, the King who weeps for our brokenness. Now, again, the commentaries I read in preparation for this morning's message agree that, albeit that Jesus' rejection by his own people was foretold in the Old Testament, Jesus feels great sorrow over the rejection of him and of what he would accomplish on the cross, which reflects God's heart. Now, people of the cross, this isn't a whimsical, oh, they don't like me, so my heart is broken kind of a feeling. It's not that, oh, they don't like me, so now I'm crying in my sleeve. It's not that. Jesus is expressing deep sorrow and anguish because don't forget, Jesus is fully God and fully man. And because being fully God, being omniscient, being all-knowing, Jesus knows what will happen to the Israelites in the first century AD. Jesus sees ahead to the sacking of Jerusalem in the year AD 70, where the Romans sacked Jerusalem and where Jerusalem's walls would be breached and the city virtually leveled to the ground. And he sees the devastation that it would bring to the Israelites. Because you see, family, the first century Israelites, they took great pride in Jerusalem. In the temple being there, the place where God dwells amongst these people. And these were amongst many things in their worldview that gave them shalom, that made them feel whole and complete. Now, beloved, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that everything in this world is fading away. That's 1 John 2 verse 17. I mean, even the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed twice, first by the Babylonians and then lastly by the Romans. And what this passage indicates to us is that trying to find our wholeness, what completes us in the things of this world is dangerous because it will never give us that lasting feeling of peace, of wholeness that we need. Beloved, if you think that job that you are really wanting to get is going to make you feel whole and complete. The chances are when you get there, it might not. You know, you, you might think once you get that relationship or once you get those friendships in your life that you are going to be made feeling whole and complete, but people are also broken, battling their own brokenness. We can't do that. It's dangerous. Again, you can place your, your hope, you can place your value in, in a specific building, you know. <laughs> that building is going to be there, you know. I always tell people we can get sidetracked by churchianity sometimes, you know. Our church is the only church that gets it wrong. 
but God uh, gets it right. Sorry, our church is the only church that gets it right. Everyone else is wrong, but that's not where we're at. God doesn't raise his children. And it's dangerous because things in this life are so fragile. Because if you find your wholeness, your completion in someone else, what happens when that person is no longer there? Because the reality is everyone on earth eventually will pass. It's dangerous. Again, what did COVID teach us? We can't tie our wholeness and completeness to a building because in COVID we couldn't even leave the house. See what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't go to church. I'm not saying we shouldn't love the church. But what I'm saying, it must be viewed in its proper light. It must be viewed in its proper life. And, and lastly, we know, we know, beloved, that at many crossroads in life, we don't necessarily choose Jesus. We might even today be offering him our praises, but still not making him our peace, our shalom. I mean, Jesus' audience, they might have knew he was the Messiah, but they only thought the Messiah was going to sort out the political external mess, not their internal mess. And beloved, we know that we can change our external circumstances until we are blue in the face. But if hearts are not changing, nothing is changing. If hearts are not changing, nothing is changing. However, what does the scripture, what does this passage show us about God's heart when we choose against him? When we choose to find our peace, our wholeness, our completion in other things barring him? He weeps. He weeps because he knows we lose everything when we choose against him. And C.S. Lewis, in his, in his great book, The Great Divorce, he, he gives such insight into this and he says, there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who say to God, Father, I will be done. And he opens up the kingdom of heaven to them. And there are those people to whom God says with tears out of his eyes, All right then, your will be done. Have it your way. And he says it with tears in his eyes because he knows in that moment we lose everything. Because he weeps, because he knows in that moment when we try and ascertain a wholeness or a complete feeling from the things the world can offer, he knows that we lose everything because we were made for him and for him alone. And this is what Jesus is showing us in this morning's gospel reading. That when we try and choose to gain our peace in the things of this world, we lose everything and that breaks his heart. So the question is, how are we to make him our peace? How are we supposed to do this? We have to see him for who he really is. The crowds at that first Palm Sunday must have thought that Jesus was revealing himself as a political messiah to sort out Rome once and for all. But we need to see him, beloved, not just as a politician, not just as a lawgiver, but we have to start seeing him as God. And that takes me to my third point, the king who was broken in our place to show the path of peace. In Paul, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul tells us that Jesus is God, both fully God and fully man. And it's when we see Jesus being fully God and fully man, offering up his back to those who beat him, offering his cheeks to those who pulled out his beard, not hiding his face from those who mocked him, and spat on him. That's when we see him having his body pierced and broken for us on the cross that we can find true peace because then that sin problem that we have in our hearts, that's paid for through Jesus. The significance we need that we try and find in the things of the world, it's given through Jesus because the King of all kings willingly died in our place. That makes us significant. The reconciliation we feel we need with God to set things right, it's there through Christ. Do you see how much hinges on this family? Do you see how much hinges on what Jesus has done for us? And it says, Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But Jesus was pierced, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us 
peace, shalom, wholeness was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. The chastisement for our peace was on him. So all we need to do, beloved, is believe in him. We need to start believing and seeing that what he has won for us as fully God and fully man is good enough for our need and exactly where we need it. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to make this alive in us. Why? So that this can give us perspective in how we deal with things in life. So we can see goals, ambitions, and relationships which are good things in its proper light in relation to Him. And it's as J.I. Packer says in his book, Knowing God, uh, Anglican theologian from Canada, he says, Once you become aware that the main business that you are here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord. I want to repeat that again. Once you become aware that the main business that you are here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord. Because once Jesus fills you and makes you whole, you can start engaging in healthy relationships. You can see that life need not be defined by your job. <laughs> you see what this does, family? However, it's a process. It's a process that the Holy Spirit graciously and patiently takes us on. If you are battling with us today, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It is a process that the Holy Spirit takes us on. Now, of course, along the way, we might have to lose certain things that we thought would give us peace. And John Stott, the British theologian, he says, Of course it costs to be a Christian, but it costs much more not to be. Of course it costs. In practice, how does this look? Daily we have to deny ourselves. We have to deny how we see ourselves, what we think is best for ourselves. And we have to allow our Father in heaven to define us by His word and also by His love to us. You see, beloved, we have to empty ourselves of self. And we have to take up our cross as Jesus did entering Jerusalem. Because, beloved, it is in the emptying of ourselves that we can be filled with Him. You see what I'm saying? It's in the emptying of self that we can be filled with Him. And if we are battling in certain aspects, we need to engage with the Holy Spirit on where we might be finding our peace, our peace or wholeness in the things of this world. And it's then that we allow the Holy Spirit to empty us of self so that we can be filled with Him. Beloved, let us not be like Shawn Michaels, the WWE wrestler. <laughs> he felt that he needed the championship in his life in order to be complete, in order to feel accepted in this life. It never measured up. Later on, in fact, he actually became a Christian. What do you think you need to be more complete and accepted today? Beloved, what do you think will make you more of a whole person today? I encourage you, don't miss the treasure who rode into Jerusalem more than 2,000 years ago. See him for who he is and what he wants for you. And as he fills you, as you deny yourself, may his life come through you then to the world around you. And as you lose yourself in Him, you will find yourself. As you lose yourself in Him, you will find yourself. Empty yourself today, beloved, of what you think should define you or bring you to completion or shalom. And allow His best to fill you as He guides you through His Word. With the Holy Spirit's guiding hand. Let his word fill you to show you where your worth should be and you will find real and abundant life. Because you know what, beloved, 10 years ago when I was actually, no, it's what, 12, 13 years ago when I was in high school. And recently I read back on my, where I thought I would be 10 years after high school. <laughs> completely different WhatsApp group now. The way I thought my life was going to go is completely different to where I am now. But praise God. It's more than I could have fathomed. It's not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not living the life I thought I would. But by God's grace, it's real life. 
because of Jesus. It's still ongoing, but it's more than I could imagine. I close with this quote by Tim Keller. What you treasure will ultimately require you to die for it. Jesus is the only treasure who died for you. And may that treasure fill you to know that you are fully known, loved and accepted by the Almighty God in Christ. And may that make you whole.